Good morning, guys. How's the connection this morning? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Good. sir. Good. Thank you. So what's today? We have a Friday, September 25th. We're working on chapter five, protein transport. And we have been discussing transport of oxygen by hemoglobin and its storage by myoglobin. Oxygen transport proteins. So what we will do is we're going to pick up from where we ended last time. That was carbon monoxide poisoning. Yeah, let's start with this one. Um, let me share the screen. Let me share the screen. All right, can you see the screen? Yes. Good. So, uh, so just to remind you, this is how uh, oxygen would bind to, uh, for example, myoglobin. Remember in myoglobin, you have eight alpha helices, right? Alpha helix segments named A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And uh, iron will be located in the, in the heme, right? In the heme, you can see the sphere here, right? And uh, there is this, one of the key histidine residues. Remember histidine has a nice nitrogen with the lone pair, right? That would bind to iron and keep it in place. So iron will have six coordination sites, right? So four will come from the heme inside the plane of the heme, one from the nitrogen on one side and one from the oxygen on the other side. And so this will be the plane of the porphyrin system. So one of the things to consider is um, that oxygen is not the only small molecule that would bind to heme, right? So iron as a metal will bind to a lot of non-metals. And one of them is unfortunately is the cause of severe poisoning by carbon monoxide. And you can see here that carbon monoxide binds heme over 2,000 uh, 2, times better than oxygen. And, but if you put that in the pocket of the, of myoglobin, for example, that binding affinity degree decreases to about 250 times better. Still better, 250 times, but not 20,000 times, right? And so because of that, uh, carbon monoxide is highly toxic. It competes with oxygen and blocks the function of myoglobin. Basically, you can see all the myoglobin in the body, hemoglobin and mitochondrial cytochromes. All of these will be uh, saturated with carbon monoxide. And so there'll be no binding site for oxygen. So why did that happen? So uh, what happens here is, uh, let's see, let's put the lone pairs. Let's put the lone pairs on carbon monoxide, for example. Carbon monoxide. And then there is an empty orbital here, right? But remember, you can draw a resonance structure where one of the lone pairs in the oxygen comes towards the carbon. And you can draw a triple bond in such a way that the lone pair remains and you get a negative charge on the carbon positive charge in the oxygen. And this lone pair is directly linear with the rest of the molecule, right? So you can see why, why this is such a strong 
lose base, right? Because of the negative charge on the oxygen. And so carbon monoxide binds in a linear fashion and oxygen will bind in a bent fashion. And the geometry is important. Remember I told you, if you have heme by itself, it's 20,000 times, right? Which is, we just saw that, 20,000 times. But if you put this in the pocket of myoglobin, and the pocket will look something like this. So let's say this is the pocket, goes like that, comes back, goes around, and so on and so forth, and like that. Now imagine the same pocket, only carbon monoxide now doesn't fit in there. Carbon monoxide doesn't fit in there. So that could explain why, why when you put this, uh, let's say this is um, hemoglobin or myoglobin. Let's put myoglobin. That would explain, explain why when heme is a component of a myoglobin, it loses affinity for carbon monoxide quite significantly. Yet it's still 250 times stronger. So carbon monoxide is still a potent poison. And so as many of you know, uh, if there's a fire in a building, right? The worst thing you can do is walk into the building without a, without a uh, gas mask. Right, because uh, especially at the end when the, when the firefighters just put out the fire and, um, uh, and stuff has not burned all the way. Remember when, when carbon burns, if there's enough oxygen, right? It'll burn all the way to carbon dioxide. If there is oxygen deficiency, right then it will burn to carbon monoxide and so the end when the fires has almost been put out you generate a lot of carbon monoxide and that's what's present in the atmosphere of the of a burned building so don't go inside without a gas mask all right so here is uh, what it will look like remember again it's a bent bent shape Right, so oxygen will bind in such a way that these lone pairs, just like what we drew, drew here, right? It'll be, it'll be a bent shape. So the shape is bent. And uh, so there are two um, histidines. There's a histidine attached here and there's histidine, which we call proximal histidine. And remember the way we name these. So this will be histidine on segment F it's going to be amino acid eight from the amino terminus, right? So proximal histidine. All right. I was wondering if we had, so I was wondering the difference between when uh, carbon monoxide binds to the heme and then when it binds to the protein pocket. Um, are we talking about, for the protein pocket, are we talking about the, the iron? That we discussed, I'm a little confused right there. Carbon monoxide binds to the iron right here. It's just that the geometry of the protein pocket, which doesn't allow it to bind in a linear fashion. Remember I told you the carbon monoxide, the lone pair is such that it's linear together with the rest of the molecule. It cannot bend oxygen binds in a bent shape carbon monoxide binds in a linear fashion and the pocket here for carbon monoxide doesn't it um, the shape of the pocket prevents it from binding in a linear fashion but it doesn't bind to the pocket it's just that uh, it's steric hindrance remember from our ochem 2 one of the key terms if you have taken ochem 2 with me i would have emphasized this 500 times steric hindrance, right? So we're not talking about some kind of interaction between carbon monoxide and the pocket. 
per se, attractive interaction. We're talking about just the geometry, stereo hindrance. Does this make sense? It binds to iron only. Yes, thank you. It binds to iron only. What is meant by the protein pocket? Protein pocket, that means is that uh, there is a um, cavity in the, in the, in the, within the protein that is not occupied by anything. And so a gas, for example, can slide in. So is that basically where the myoglobin goes in with the heme to give away the oxygen? Well, just uh, think about it. So, uh, so remember, so let's say this is your protein, right? So here you have uh, all the various uh, hydrophilic amino acids on the outside, right? All the polar amino acids which interact with water. What do you have inside? You have hydrophobic amino acids, right? And inside of the protein, you have all the hydrophobic amino acids. And they are occupying as much space as possible to exclude, to exclude water. But it's possible that sometimes these hydrophobic residues leave behind pockets like that. So in other words, it's a, it's a space which is not occupied by any amino acid. And that's where, uh, for example, small molecules like to bind. Small molecules or gases like to bind. Oh, okay, so that's, so that's kind of where the heme is located partially so well, that the oxygen can bind in that location. Well, him, yeah, there's space for him, obviously, for the space created for him, for prosthetic group, yes. Okay. All right, let's move on. Now, so, Uh, hema, uh, the heme group is a strong chromophore that absorbs in the ultraviolet and visible range. And one thing to keep in mind, so for example, hemoglobin, which basically lives in uh, red blood cells, right? So um, uh, the, um, the precursor cells, I don't know if we need to know such level of detail, but precursor cells are known as hemocytoblasts, but they give rise to erythrocytes. Okay. Um, so hemoglobin Hemoglobin constitutes thirty five percent by weight the entire structure of erythrocyte. of erythrocyte. Of erythrocyte. And so uh, when you, uh, when the oxygen is not bound to it, it's uh, in the ferrous form, iron two plus, it's without oxygen. It has intense sorted bands. So sorted band basically it's, a, it's an intense band in the blue region of the spectrum at 429 nanometers. And so ferrous form um, 
Now, when oxygen binds to it, it changes the electronic properties of the heme and shifts the position to 414 nanometers. And so this can be monitored by UV vis uh, spectrophotometry. So deoxyhemoglobin, which is basically hemoglobin in erythrocytes in venous blood, right? So the blood going towards the arteries, not towards the heart. So um, in venous blood, it's uh, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is only sixty four percent saturated. Saturated with oxygen. Right, so what that means is that 36% of it will have no oxygen. And so this blood appears purplish in color. Oxyhemoglobin in the arterial blood, right, the blood that comes out of the lungs with lots of oxygen in it. Um, is 96% saturated. So the question for you, when blood the, can, can, uh, makes the entire uh, run from the lungs in back into the lungs, how much oxygen will it deliver to the tissues? So uh, it's almost fully saturated, right? So how, what's, the, what's the proportion of oxygen that will be delivered to the tissues? 30%. Yeah, so one third of all the oxygen will be delivered to the tissues. And if you... Um, put some numbers to it. So each 100 ml of blood each 100 ml of blood will deliver 6.5 milliliter of oxygen. Just to give you an idea of uh, how much oxygen is carried to the tissues by the hemoglobin and erythrocytes. And erythrocytes, keep in mind that uh, erythrocytes are very interesting cells. Um, in their maturation process, uh, basically, they lose all the organelles. So we talked about all the organelles inside the eukaryotic cells, right? And so when erythrocytes mature, they will lose nucleus, they will lose mitochondria, they will lose endoplasmic reticulum. So basically, they're just incomplete cells, and their only function is to, to carry hemoglobin with and without blood back and forth throughout the systemic circulation and they will live for about 120 days until after which time new erythrocytes will be born and take place all the, all the ones that are dying. Any questions about this slide? How do you get the 6.5 milliliters? Um, how do you get the 64? Yeah, you need to know the concentration of the, you, from the numbers I gave you, you can't. You need to know the concentration of erythrocytes in the in the blood. 
okay. which I don't know. It's something that we can look look up. If if you want to do this exercise, you're welcome. Okay. But you need to know the concentration of erythrocytes in the blood. All right. So uh, could myoglobin transport oxygen? And the answer is no, right? So myoglobin has very strong affinity for oxygen and see what happens. So remember, so uh, we saw this graph before. You can see here uh, P50, remember this is the partial concentration of oxygen at which 50% uh, of all the sites on, on myoglobin are occupied by oxygen, okay? And you can see this is a very small number, it's less than one, I don't even know what this number is. I think it's point like 28 or something. I just, just this number got stuck in my head, point 0.28 maybe. Um, but something we can look, look up, but it's not really that critical. What's important for us to know, it's a very small number and it's this number that's significantly smaller than four. Four is the critical number here. And the other critical number is 13. So why is four and 13 are the numbers of most interest for us on this graph? Those are the pressures that are uh, of, um, those are the partial pressures of oxygen when in the lungs and in the tissues. Right, and so uh, how much oxygen, so basically the myoglobin, let's say myoglobin would go into the lungs uh, the, the partial pressure of oxygen there is 13 kilopascal, 13 kilopascals. It goes to the tissues where it's four kilopascals. How much oxygen will be, will be released into the tissue? Not much. None, none, oh, well, the, the tiny bit, and I don't know how much you can even, I don't know if you can even draw it here, but um, this much, right? Tiny bit. So myoglobin basically by itself will not be a good delivery system, right? So uh, what needs to be done, what needs to be done is somehow the myoglobin, when it goes into the tissue, we want this number stay the same, about uh, 1.0, but what we want to draw this down as much as possible, drag, drag down and if you think about it well you know it's the same protein the same oxygen how do you do that right so whether it's in the lungs whether it's in the tissue how can you do that and there are a number of ways that uh, biological systems have accomplished that and one of them is the uh, generation of what's known as sigmoidal shape so in other words if you imagine a protein, which is not myoglobin, which is going to be slightly larger because uh, we need additional uh, function from this protein. And this protein is capable of adopting two states. One of them will be high affinity state. You can see here, high affinity state that you can see in the tissues and in the lungs is the same and, uh, and low affinity state. You can see here, it's a much lower number here, but again, um, it's not so good for us. What we're looking for, we're looking for some kind of sigmoidal shape, which basically, again, grabs as much oxygen as possible in the lungs, but then drops down and releases, uh, here's, this will be about 40%, right? We want this 40% to be released. In the tissues. Does everybody see where the 40% is coming from? No. Well, what's the difference between 1.0 or 1.6? Oh, okay, that's, I was looking at the 40%. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so this will be 0.4, right? 0.4 fraction. So, this is the 40% we're looking for. If we can get a protein with this kind of uh, sigmoidal shape, then we should be able to drop 40% in the tissue. And so, uh, so this protein, it must be a protein with multiple binding sites. 
binding sites must be interact with each other. The phenomenon, phenomenon is called cooperativity. And we're gonna be talking about what's known as positive cooperativity. So in other words, first binding event increases affinity at remaining sites. And usually these are recognized by sigmoidal binding curves. And uh, there is negative cooperativity. So let's see which one works best for us. So this will be the opposite. First binding event reduces affinity at remaining sites. So here, here, here is how this will work. So let's say you have a protein with two, um, I don't know what they would call these, um, subunits, subunits. Let's say you have a, a protein with two subunits and there are two binding sites, right? But the binding sites are kind of uh, only like half closed, right? So there's, it's like a bowl with no lid. So the, the ligand can come in and go, come in and go. But the lid is right there. The lid is right there and it's open. We want this lid to come in and close, right? And so what will happen is, um, so with, without any ligand, the lid is widely open. Much of the molecule is either flexible for conformations facilitate blah, 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 blah. And so let's say the ligand, one, the, the first molecule of ligand comes in and occupies this binding site and the lid closes because there's some kind of um, very nice positive attractive interaction occurring on this side of the molecule. And let's see what happens with this lid. This lid just migrated from here to there or, clo or even closer, right? So the binding of the ligand on this side forced this lid to come closer to this binding site. And so this second molecule of ligand will come in. Now, uh, are we dealing with positive cooperativity or negative cooperativity here? Positive. Positive, right? Because the binding of this ligand will allow for the second ligand to come in and, and bind more easily because the lid is closer. So this is positive cooperativity and this is what we need for, um, for a protein that will have this sigmoidal shape. So basically, uh, once you, uh, let's say you go to the lungs, right, you go to the lungs, uh, you bind one molecule of, ox of oxygen and then once you bind one molecule of oxygen, then the second one is right there and ready to go then the third one and, and faster and then more and more um, the binding of the next molecule of oxygen will be more and more, um, uh, what's the right word? Not efficient, but- um, like it, Likely to occur. Likely to occur, thank you. All right. Now there are two models of cooperativity. Um, they talk about this in your in your group in your text. Uh, I just put this out here. It's not really uh, something that uh, we need to discuss in great detail. It's just there's been a lot of studies with with oxygen transport proteins, so that you should know that there's a lot of theory here. Um, so, for example, uh, concerted cooperativity here when. Um, one molecule of ligand bind, let's say there are four subunits, right? One molecule of ligand binds, and then uh, it's all or nothing. Nothing happens, or each of these four subunits change shape and are ready for the next molecule of ligand. And, they, and it's more likely to occur when it's square rather than a circle, right? And so two ligands, even better. Three ligands, even better. But you can see here, so going from the circle to the square is the favorable event, which will allow for, more, for, for the ligand to come in and bind more easily. So, uh, so this will be concerted when, when all four change their shapes at the same time. And they're sequential when you have a, um, all circles, but then one will change, another will change, third and a fourth. 
right? And so, and obviously the more ligand binds, the more if effective this process is. So one ligand binds, and then uh, this changes shape into the square. And because this has changed the shape into the square, the adjacent one is more likely to change into the square and more likely to bind the ligand. Now that we have two ligands, this is more likely to change into the square. It changes into the square and binds the ligand. Or it binds the ligand first and then changes into the square. So the, um, the order can be different. So these are all different possible possibilities. But basically what this graph is showing is if they're the same shape, it's more likely, it's, it's stronger binding affinity as more more attach. Yeah, so the, the ligand binding uh, will can change shape and they more easily and the change shape will make the ligand bind more easily too. So either one works. So okay. in, in that example, they're all the same. Say it again. So in this example, then they're all the same. Yeah. Like equal and okay. affinity. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, so uh, usually this is known as allosteric regulation. Now, uh, let me see. Uh, can you remember? I, uh, though it was in your textbook. From what I remember, allos is a Greek word. No, I'm sorry if I misspelled this. Allos means other in Greek. Uh, and steric means steric. Hold on a second. Yeah, I guess stereos means shape. Means shape. So what this means is that um, if uh, you can have, uh, so you have a ligand, right? So you have a ligand on one side uh, but uh, you can also have uh, a different ligand uh, come into this protein and it will bind at a different site on the protein. That's why it's other. And it will make the protein change shape. It will make the protein change shape and alter the affinity of the main ligand to the protein. Can, it can decrease it or increase it. And so this other ligand so can be, uh, this event can be called homotropic. So when the, uh, when the normal ligand of the protein is the allosteric regulator, such as the oxygen with hemoglobin, right? So you can see here one oxygen comes in and um, will increase the affinity for the next molecule of oxygen and so on and so forth. And can also be heterotropic. So in this case, it's going to be a different ligand, which will affect the binding of the normal ligand. And we will see actually an example. So this is homotropic that we just talked about, but there is also uh, heterotropic bisphosphoglycerate. And we'll see it not if in this lecture or on Monday, we'll see an example of a heterotropic allosteric regulation. So the proteins which are which can be regulated by by other molecules are known as allosteric proteins, right? So not only they have the, the actual natural ligand, they also have allosteric sites, allosteric sites on the molecule, which can be used to regulate the binding of the main ligand. So the protein that accomplishes everything we've said so far is hemoglobin, abbreviated is HB. So it's a tetramer of two subunits. There are two alpha and two beta subunits. And each subunit is similar to myoglobin. 
So you can see here, um, in fact, the interesting thing is that there's not so much sequence similarity. Um, so the for alpha and beta, so the amino acid sequences amino acid sequences are identical at only 27 positions. This is actually quite amazing. Only 27 positions And uh, keep in mind that these are 150 residue, uh, 150 residue um, proteins, right? And so, but you can see that, for example, this is beta subunit of hemoglobin, right? One of the beta subunits, and this is myoglobin, and they look very, very similar. So it's uh, one example of uh, how. Um, um, even though the primary sequence of amino acids can be quite different, the proteins can still adopt very similar three-dimensional structure. Sorry, um, I'm a bit confused with that. So you said that the amino acid sequences are, ident are identical only at 27 positions. Are those 27 amino acid positions in the chain? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after that, that's where they differ. And all the other ones are different. Mm -hmm. All the other ones are different. So uh, now in, in the text, you have a whole bunch of figures showing different projections of, uh, of hemoglobin with the um, four subunits, two alpha and beta subunits. You can look at those. I didn't really, I looked at those. I didn't really get much information out of them. So, um, if you find something useful, you uh, you're welcome. Um, but I will obviously not test you on those because I did um, I didn't really find anything useful. So um, um, and obviously I will give you this weekend. Maybe not even this. Maybe on Saturday evening I will send you the pages to read from the textbook in preparation for your test. All right, so so hemoglobin, so the alpha subunit, uh, four, four subunits, and it turns out that, remember I told you about the sigmoidal shape? So we want a, we want a uh, one state where it binds to the oxygen very strongly. And that state, do we want that state to be in the, in the lungs or in the tissues? Issues. Think about it. So you want hemoglobin to be to, to have very high affinity for oxygen. In the lungs. The lungs. You want it to be in the lungs. So you can absorb it can absorb as much oxygen from the lungs as possible. And so we call this tense state. Okay. So more interactions, more stable. No, no, no. We call this relaxed state. So uh, more stable, high affinity for oxygen. And in a tissue, we want it to be in a tense state, right? So we want lower affinity for oxygen so the hemoglobin can release that oxygen into the tissue. And uh, so um, what, what we want, we just discussed, we want oxygen binding to trigger this T to R conformational change, right? 
So we wanted to go from tense in the tissue to the R relaxed in the lungs so it can absorb as much oxygen as possible. And so, um, so there is a, now how it's accomplished, it's still being studied. Uh, as I mentioned, there are a couple of figures in the text that they put, which I still didn't find quite convincing, but there's still a lot of research. But the idea is that there's some, um, what I want you to get from this is what, what's on the slide. So basically, um, the transition from the T state to R state involves, involves breaking of ion pairs. So uh, basically, um, of all the uh, sec of all the attractive interactions, interactive forces within the protein, it's the breaking of the ion pairs which is responsible for the transition from the T state to the R state, which will occur in the lungs. And um, I'll show you one example of that without a three-dimensional figure, but I'll show you um, just using organic chemistry structures. So uh, um, there is one figure that actually I liked uh, is this one, it's figure 511. So you can see here, uh, so this is a representation of the T state. This is the representation of the R state, right? So this is in the tissue. And so you can see here that without the oxygen, right, when it's in a T state, iron is kind of, um, is not exactly in the middle of the heme, right? So a larger portion of the iron atom is sticking out towards the uh, hemoglobin. And remember, this is the histidine, right? Uh, which is responsible for binding to the iron. And so this histidine, uh, because iron is kind of moving towards it, this histidine is moving inside the protein to a certain degree and changes shape of the protein. Now in the R state, in the lungs, when this oxygen comes and binds to the iron, now I can see iron is almost like in the middle of this heme, right? And the histidine is pulled away from the hemoglobin protein, which will change the shape and put it in the R state. And so the idea is that, so this minor change, this slight movement of the iron, which occurs, which is triggered by oxygen binding, can uh, break or make one specific salt bridge within the structure of hemoglobin and put it shifted from the T state to the R state. I think that's as much as uh, I really um, want you to understand from um, uh, regarding the shift from the T state to the R state. Uh, so as I mentioned, the, um, the book goes in the more detail, but um, all that is still uh, um, been researched very heavily. So, um, <clears throat> is this what you're talking about? The break, the ion, the iron salt break. The ion, sorry, the ion, uh, the salt bridge break. Where? Do you see the orange on your screen? No, there is a. These are um, valine and leucine. So these are not. These are not charged amino acids. Okay, um, so you just mentioned that there was a ion break or salt break. Can you show us where that is on here? Or is it not shown? No, I don't have a slide. If you, uh, you will see, okay. I'll give you a specific figure if you're interested. Figure five, nine. Figure five nine. It's basically a description of all the various salt bridges within the hemoglobin. You see, there's there's more just one. It's that's why I, I don't think we just need some all this information, you know. I see what you mean. So figure five nine has a lot of uh, it shows you a lot of uh, salt bridges and so it's still being investigated.
All right. Let's see, we have four minutes. I don't know if I should go into this. Uh, Professor, I have a question. Yeah, ask me, ask me questions because uh, I don't want to start now. The acidity is very important for uh, to describe because um, tissues are much more acidic than the lungs and the acidity contributes to the oxygen affinity for hemoglobin, so-called Bohr's effect. And I don't want to start it right now because we don't have much time left. So in a couple few minutes that are left, just ask me questions. So I, I think I'm, I'm done with the slides for now. Okay, uh, you said we need to know the concentration of erythrocytes in the blood. I mean, did you say it earlier? Well, there was a question about um, one of the numbers I gave you. I mean, I didn't ask you to calculate it, but if you want to, go ahead. Okay, so it's just kind of one of those, if you want to know about it, we don't have to for the test. No. Okay, thank you. Anything else? All right, so I uh, will uh, put this on YouTube. Now homework, remember guys, homework is due right before the test, right on Wednesday. Saturday night, I'll send you pages to read in the textbook. Are there any other questions? Yeah, um, for the PowerPoints that are online, would you be able to upload the annotated ones as well? Um, yeah, they are uh, in, in the recordings, right? Yeah, they are. Um, I was just wondering if we could also get the ones that, you know, so the, the ones you draw on in class, because uh, they are on the recordings, but um, I was just wondering if we could also get the ones on the PowerPoints just without the video. Yeah, I can see what I had. I kind of made a mess of those because I, I don't think I use the same file for each lecture. So oh, I see. I'll see. I'll see what I have. No worries if you don't. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I was hoping if there was any way if you could upload like more practice problems for the previous chapters. I was hoping to practice it for the exam from Sapling. So Sapling is not enough for you? Uh, it's more like um, I want to retry the previous homeworks uh, one more time to uh, be able to comprehend it and reinforce my memory. You know there are problems in the text. You can work on those. Okay. Okay. There are problems in the text. You can work on those, and those are those come once you if you paid. Obviously, you paid for the text. Those are free with the answers. But there's also uh, additional problems for the text, which you can buy, unfortunately. But there is uh, there is many levels of problems. So uh, so there is ones that you can access without having to pay. Uh, if that's still not enough then uh, it gives you an option. You can buy the um, supplementary um, problem set with, with solutions. All right, I yeah. think the textbook questions will be enough. Thank you so much. Yeah, and keep also, in mind, the, keep in mind, they will, they will, I know there was, uh, you guys all get scared by home, by sapling homework three, um, but uh, I will, Try not to include so much math into the into the test. So don't worry about it. Would you be able to give us a hint of like which math we should practice so that we can prepare for that? Uh, whatever the um, pages I give you in the textbook, you will see. Okay. Okay. So the the pages that you're going to give us on Saturday, they're for all the chapters that we've covered. Yes. Oh, okay. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Christopher, I think um, you can redo the sapling homework if you go through. Um, if you use Safari, it doesn't work as well, but if you use like Firefox, you should be able to redo the sapling homework. Yeah, I tried to do it through Google Chrome. It won't let me retry it. So that's the reason why I was hoping that he could have 
uh, reopen the homework, but I'll go check it out again. Thanks. Yeah, try, try Firefox. All right, all right. Yeah, if I reopen the homework, you you have the opportunity to um, uh, get more points, which you shouldn't be able to. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I just was hoping to retry like a practice version of it, but okay, I'll try the Firefox. Okay. All right, guys, have a good weekend. Stay healthy. I'll see you on Monday. Thank you.